day, and it's an honor to be with you, back with my friend, Peter Holmes. Um, as you're turning there, for those of you who don't know me, this is all I do for a living. Last year, I was in 13 nations and, um, and did 481-hour sessions. So it's, uh, things are going really, really well, in other words. Um, we were all over the world. I have had the privilege of being mentored by a pastor who happens to have his rabbi training uh, for the last 11 years. And so all my stuff comes from that. I also have a master's degree in clinical psychology. So if you're messed up in your head, I can try to help you. Um, <laughs> On your, on your way out today, um, you're going to come by a table full of our resources. Now, our resources um, are available in three formats, CD, DVD, and USB, all right? If you don't know what a USB is, get the CD, all right? If, if, or you can get an 11-year-old to show you how to do it. It's easy to do. Um, but these things are, they're half the price, and they hold twice as much. And so you could pick those things up back there. Uh, the reason I mention that now is that 100% of the profit from that goes to our main mission in the world, which is to take care of the poor and the afflicted. Um, we are now in partnership with five orphanages, two in Hinyang, one in Changsha, one in Escort, one in Marmalodi, South Africa. The Chinese orphanages take care of mentally handicapped children. The uh, South African orphanages take care of children whose parents have died of AIDS. And so um, it's, really, it's really bringing heaven to every place we see hell. Um, we also have a ministry in Cape Town that is now a viable option recognized by the Department of Justice in South Africa as, an, as a viable alternative to Polsmore Prison. And so um, that's, that's there as well. And so obviously that takes funding. And so the way our business model works is we run our ministry on honorariums and offerings. So all the plane tickets and my salary and, and, and office costs and all that kind of stuff, that, that gets run from honorariums and offerings. Um, but, the, but what we decided to do, instead of asking for money everywhere, we went. We just set it up where the resources, 100% of the profit from that goes to, to those things. And so um, that started going so well that two years ago we realized we need to start believing God for a director of charity and um, to, to look after it. And so we started believing God to put someone in our path that had that heart. And so uh, a couple years ago I became friends um, with the Jolly family and, um, and, and got, became friends with Emma. I just got to know her and, um, and started to see her heart. Someone who was using vacation time at 24 years old to go to Asia to work with an organization to get girls out of sex slavery. And so um, you, you take a 24 Four year old young lady who, instead of going to the Gold Coast for two weeks for vacation, she's going to Thailand to try to bring heaven to hellish situations. I thought, oh, hmm. So um, in, talking, in talking to, uh, to her, I ended up having a coffee with her dad, and I said, is this a fad, or is this something that's like been on her life for a while? And her dad said, no, no, this is, um, this is as far as I know, this is all she's ever wanted to do, was to help the poor and to be a missionary. So um, after putting her in, uh, running her by my board of directors here, the board of directors in America, and my pastoral board, they all unanimously said that this was a God move. And so um, I, I, I thought about the heaviness of it. Like um, I needed someone I could trust to build the most important part of my ministry. And so the most important part of our ministry is to take care of the poor and the afflicted. It's not what I do. It's not what my brother does. It's not all these other things. It's what she's doing. And so, um, and so I believe that God put um, her in our path, and so does my board of directors. And so um, I can't tell you how much I believe in what's on her life. And so um, when you get to meet her um, today afterwards, just come back, uh, come back to the back. She'll be there. If you want to give her your information um, in order to, to be put on a list when she does mission trips and things like that, um, you could do that. You could just come back there and say hello. And so here's all I'm asking you to do is on your way out the day before you go feed your belly, would you come by the table? Let me put something in your hands that'll, that'll change the way you look at God forever. And in so doing, you put something in our hands that helps us feed people that can't eat, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you a very short video um, to show you uh, something from an actual trip uh, we just did. And then, um, and then I'm gonna have Emma come up and talk to you for, for a few minutes. And then, and then we're gonna look at Revelation 21 and how this applies to us. You can go ahead and roll the video.
so what does love look like? It's interesting the places that God chooses to reveal his love to us. For me, it hasn't been amidst my comforts or unnecessary needs, but rather it's been in the slums of rural townships. It's been on my knees in the dirt, gazing into the faces of people who are hungry and needy. It has been in these places that I have experienced the rawness of my father's love. Since I was a teenager, I've dreamt about traveling the world and serving the poor. You will see many nations were the words that were prophesied over me multiple times. In fact, I remember the thoughts that used to resound in my head and the dreams that used to awaken me at night. The video you just saw was footage that was taken for my most recent trip, where I spent two months traveling through Singapore, Hong Kong, China, and South Africa with Shane Willard Ministries. My entire world was changed as I held those little children and spent time in the dirt with the kids in South Africa. One of my most memorable moments on this trip was when I held little Shushu. He was the little man you would have seen me holding in the, vi in the middle of the video. He has meningitis, which sadly has left him severely disabled. He's unable to move most parts of his body. He cannot speak and he has regular seizures. When I walked into that orphanage, I was drawn to the bedside of this little man. I stood over him and I looked into his eyes. Tears began to stream down my cheeks as I asked to hold him. As I held that little man, I can tell you there was an exchange. There was an exchange of my time and love. When I returned home from this trip, I was surprised by the amount of people that said to me, exposure to life on the other side would most definitely make you appreciative of what you have. But if I've come here for any other reason today but to tell you guys that that was not my experience at all. In fact, it was the complete opposite. Yes, things are nice, but there is so much more that needs to stem from an encounter with extreme material poverty than just a mentality of appreciation. God has called each and every one of us to give, and with great awareness comes great responsibility. A life of accumulation for self is not a life. We are each called to step outside of the box of self and live for the betterment of another. It's so easy to look at the statistics on a piece of paper or the face on a video and be moved by emotion, yet do nothing. But I want to tell you guys that it's not okay that 27 million people are currently living in slavery. It's not okay that children as young as four years old are being chained to beds beaten and forced to have sex with multiple seedy men every single day. It's not okay that young boys are being trained to hate and kill in Africa. It's not okay that 121 million children are currently out of education. And it's certainly not okay that 16,900 children would die of starvation just today. It's just not okay. And on the flip side of that, how is it fair that the world's richest the, the world's richest population consumes 20% of the world's wealth. How is it fair that 12% of the global population uses 85% of the world's clean water? And how is it fair that in 1998, the United States spent $8 billion on cosmetics and Europe spent $11 billion on ice cream? What was spent on these two items alone could instantly put basic sanitation, water, and education for the whole world. I'm constantly reminding myself that behind every number is a face, and that each of these faces has a name, a heartbeat, and the right to a hopeful future full of opportunity. No one is insignificant to God. He hears the cries of every little girl who's been sold into slavery. He sees the tears of every little boy who's been abandoned or abused. He feels the heartache of every person who is impoverished or suffering. We can all be facilitators of hope, love, and change. Let's not allow the numbers to overwhelm us. When all is said and done, I don't want to be remembered as somebody that just spoke about love and compassion, but rather I want to be remembered as somebody that emanated and reflected it. So what does love look like? Love is food to the hungry. Love is water to the thirsty. Love to the orphan has been adopted into a family. Love to the hopeless is opportunity, and to the homeless it is shelter. 
Yes, the statistics are overwhelming, but I choose to hold on to God's promise in Isaiah 45 2 that says, He will go before me and level the mountains. In fact, it was the staff within Moses' hand that God used to bring freedom to an entire nation. All that was required was his response and action to the Father's call. It's almost like the Lord is saying, what will you do with the resources and opportunities I have placed within your hands? Will you keep them to yourself or will you share them with those who through no fault of their own lack? Everything we need has already been given to us by God. Will you share your time, your heart, your resources and your lives with these precious people? Will you choose to live for their betterment? Will you choose to be honourable distributors of the resource the Father has given us? Will you love? Can I challenge you not just to be a group of people that talks about changing the world, but rather a group of people that's actively doing something about it? Thank you. Because it's very obvious why we felt like we believed in her so much, hey? Can you feel the sincerity come from it? I think she's going to do something amazing um, in this world. Revelation 21. I was challenged uh, several months ago. <clears throat> I was having lunch with a pastor who's in his late 60s, and he's a, he's a friend of mine. I would call him a father or a mentor, and I know he's very solid. And so we were having lunch together, and he asked me, he said, Shane, do you reckon you're going to enjoy heaven? And, um, and so my in initial response, like if I asked you, do you reckon you're going to enjoy heaven, what would your response be? All right. <clears throat> so that was my initial response too. I said, well, yeah, I mean, how can you stuff heaven up? It's, it's heaven, right? Like if heaven can get stuffed up, man. So he, um, but he had tears in his eyes and he was being very sincere. He said, I'm not so sure about me. And I said, um, tell me about this. Because I knew how solid of a person he was. I said, tell me. He said, um, the Holy Spirit challenged me to do something, and I'm going to challenge you to do it. He said, I want you to go back and read every single thing Jesus said about heaven and ask yourself if you would enjoy it. I said, okay. So I did. And what I found was when I went back and re-looked at everything Jesus said about heaven, I found heaven very challenging and confronting. Like, let me give you an example. Jesus said that in heaven, every secret, desire, every secret conversation of your heart will be revealed for all to see. You want to go there? You, you want to go to the place where... Um, have, you, have you ever been sitting over lunch and someone's saying something and you're going, in your heart, you're going, you're an idiot. But on the outside, you're going... Well, in heaven, the you're an idiot part gets put up um, because we can't have disingenuous motives. Really? You want, to, you want to get on that bus? Jesus described heaven once as a table with every tribe, tongue, and race. So if you're a racist, well, let's say, because none of you would be racist. Let, let's, let, let's say that you know a racist. You have a friend who's a racist. And he's at the hospital. And uh, he's got two minutes to live. And you go and you urge him to submit his life to Jesus Christ. And so he does. He, he says, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got two minutes to live, you know. I don't know why. I've never done any of this. I don't know what in the world all this is about. But yeah, 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 yeah. I got two minutes to live. Why not? And so with 15 seconds to live, he asks you, hey, what does this even mean? I'm going to die in 15 seconds. Why did I do that? And you don't even know what to say. So you go, well, you'll wake up in heaven instead of hell. And so the racist says, well, that, that's fantastic. That sounds much better. So this racist dies. Where does he go? He goes to heaven, right? So this racist dies and goes to heaven and he wakes up at a table with every tribe, tongue, and race. Is he in heaven or hell? <clears throat> to the racist, heaven is hell. What, what I found with Jesus was, Jesus never invited people to go to heaven. I found that fascinating. He never said, hey, there's this place you can go after you die, and I'm gonna invite you to pray a prayer and ask me in your heart so you can go there. He never said that, ever. Jesus, in ne Jesus never invited people to go to heaven, and no one ever took him that way. No one ever said to Jesus, oh, great, you're here, we can go to heaven now. No one. Jesus died and rose from the dead. Pretty impressive. Came back. How much did he talk about heaven? None. How much did he talk about hell? None. I find that fascinating. What I find more fascinating is no one asked him. If I die, I, I have a seven-year relationship with this church. I think you know me. If I died today 
and you came to my funeral on Wednesday, and then I showed up here next Sunday and wrecked your service. <clears throat> Peter says, oh my goodness, Shane Willard's back. I'm sure I just saw him die. Get it, get him, he's back for the dead. My God, get, get him a mic. Let's ask questions. How many questions would we get through before someone said, hey, what was heaven like? What happened on the other side? But you know, no one did that with Jesus. Jesus comes back for the dead and no one goes, hey, what was heaven like? What was hell like? I heard you preach there. How'd your altar call go? Did you clean out hell, you rascal, you? You know, when you rose from the dead, tombs emptied everywhere, that's amazing. Can you tell us, was that your altar call? No one asked him. No one asked him about heaven. No one asked him about hell. And Jesus doesn't mention it. Here was their response. Jesus comes back for the dead and their response is, oh great, you're back. Are we gonna take over Rome now? Is it now the kingdom's coming to the earth? Why would that be the response? Well, if you're gonna do a book report on any book, you gotta read to the end, right? What is God doing in Genesis 1? In Genesis 1, he's making a new creation on the earth. On Revelation 22, what is God doing? He's making a new creation on the earth. So the beginning of the Bible, God's making a new creation on the earth. And the end of the Bible, God's making a new creation on the earth. And then everything in the middle, what's God doing? He's making little new creations on the earth. So the beginning of the Bible is all about God making a new creation on the earth. The end of the Bible is all about God making a new creation on the earth. And everything in the middle is about God making new creations on the earth to prepare the earth for the new creation coming to the earth. So the beginning of the Bible is all about what God's doing on earth. The end of the Bible is all about what God's doing on earth. And everything in the middle is about what God's doing on earth. And somehow our message became how to go to heaven? Really? How did we do that? It's like somebody somewhere made up something. That was not Jesus' message. Jesus' message was never how to go to heaven. Jesus' message was, here's what heaven looks like. Go ahead and line your life up with it right now because the blessed hope is that heaven one day is going to come to earth. And when heaven does come to earth, I want the earth to be ready. So go ahead and line your life up with it now so that if you walked into heaven tomorrow, you wouldn't get whiplash. That was Jesus' divine invitation. Why are you waiting to go to heaven to have your life be okay? The divine invitation of Jesus is, is that your life can be great right now. And here's the end of the book. If you could bring up my, there you go. Here's the end, Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer is. That sentence makes no sense unless you understand ancient Jewish euphemisms. In, in, in the first century, the sea was a euphemism for unbelievers. So in other words, he's saying finally, that everybody's on the same page. Uh, right before that, he says, every knee bowed and every tongue confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord. And now he's saying, there's no more sea. In other words, we're finally all on the same page. We're not arguing about stupid stuff. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. So in Revelation 21, who is going up to heaven? No one. I, I get so concerned that people who are waiting to go up like their whole focus in life is how do we go up? How do we go up? That when God finally comes down, you're gonna pass him in the middle? <laughs> you're gonna miss everything God's doing? At the end of the Bible, no one's going up to heaven. Everything in heaven is coming back to earth. And the mission of the church of Jesus Christ is to establish the kingdom now because when heaven does come to earth, we don't want the earth to get whiplash. The goal of Jesus is if you walked into heaven tomorrow that your life would just go on because you've been living like this for a very long time. Coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be them and be their God. There's this finally, this thing has happened. Here's my question. If this happened tomorrow, would you enjoy it? If the environment of heaven invaded your life tomorrow, what parts of you would survive and what parts of you would be burned up? See, see, when we think of images of judgment, we tend to think of hell, fire, brimstone, and we always apply that to other people. No one ever applies it to themselves. We always apply that to other people. The problem with that is this. In the whole Bible, there are six mentions of fire and hell. Six in the whole Bible. 
Six mentions of fire in hell. There are 229 mentions of fire in heaven. So how is then that the focus of the church has always been fire in hell when there's 25 times more mentions of fire in heaven? Why would we do that? As a, as a matter of fact, if your goal in eternity is to avoid fire, it shouldn't be, but if your goal in eternity is to avoid fire, hell's probably your better choice. Hell will let you stay greedy. Hell will let you stay a racist. Hell, hell will let you do those things. The, the question is it, I, listen, and by the way, it, it's very insulting, if I can just make a point, it's very insulting to Jesus if the only reason you're following him is to not go to hell. Like if Jesus asked you, why are you following me? If your answer is, well, I'd hate to go to hell, that is very degrading to Jesus. That's like telling your wife, the only reason I'm with you is because I don't want to be with that ugly chick. I mean, I'm with you because option B sucks. That, that, what is that? What is that? You shouldn't be following Jesus because you don't want to go to hell. You should be following Jesus because you actually believe he has the best way to live. Like, not go to hell, really? Really? If you could go to heaven without Jesus, would you still follow him? I hope so. I hope you're not following Jesus because of heaven. I hope you're following Jesus because you actually believe he has the best way to live. And his challenge to us is, are you allowing heaven to be established? Now, here's what heaven looks like. How are you doing with that? Well, now, that requires us to ask some questions. If the kingdom of heaven invaded your life today, what parts of you would survive and what parts of you would be burned up? Like, you realize there's, that greed is not allowed there. So if you have a greed problem, the invitation of Jesus is go ahead and get that life off of you now. If you walked into heaven tomorrow, you're going to get whiplash. Don't do that. Don't do that. Let, let's say it this way. If you walked into heaven today, would you recognize it as heaven or would you think it was hell? Is there any parts of how Jesus described heaven that you would think that would be horrible if we actually lived like that? Three, are Jesus' descriptions of the kingdom of heaven congruent with your life? Where would your life struggle to live in that environment? Maybe we can say it this way. What pruning needs to take place in your life now so that the kingdom can be established in you today? Why would you wait? The, the word in the Bible, judgment or punishment, is the word colossus, which means to prune an apple tree. The idea is not to utterly destroy somebody. As a matter of fact, the ancient Jews believed that God's anger never contends with people forever, and he does not utterly destroy people because he is God and not a man. The issue Jesus, when Jesus talked about judgment, he talked about being a vine dresser, and he looks at your life, and the branches that bear fruit, he celebrates, but the branches that don't bear fruit, he cuts off. That's pruning. J Jesus essentially said it this way. He said, prune yourself here so you will not be pruned there. In other words, whatever's on your life, here's what heaven looks like. Whatever's on your life that can't exist there, go ahead and get it off now. Go ahead and do it. And this is not about forgiveness. Forgiveness was free. This is not about forgiveness. This is about God's utter commitment to make you the best you can be in his kingdom without taking your free will away. This is about God honoring the environment of heaven by allowing people to choose. He's like, no, 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 go ahead and get up. In one place in Matthew 23, he said it this way. It's better to throw yourself on a rock than to have a rock hurled upon you. That's an ancient Jewish euphemism for parenting. It just simply means this. Boy, you sort this out or I'll sort this out and you would much better sort it out yourself. That's something you'd say to your kid. So what pruning needs to take place in your life now? If heaven happened tomorrow, what parts of you would be okay? What parts of you wouldn't? Check out the scripture, 1 Corinthians 3. It says, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation, so we're talking about people who've built on the foundation of Jesus. In today's vernacular, you might call them saved or whatever word you want to put around it. They've built on the foundation of Jesus. If they use gold, silver, costly stones, or wood, hay, and straw. I love that observation. In other words, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, if your foundation's Jesus, you're good. Their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. Now, is this talking about fire in heaven or fire in hell? This is heaven. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive reward. If, what is, if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, yet will be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames of heaven. Here's my question. My question isn't, are you gonna go to heaven? My question is, if you walked into heaven tomorrow, what parts of you would survive? And what parts of you would have to be burned off? 
And the invitation of Jesus is, go ahead and burn it off now. It's way, way easier. Here's, here's another one, Malachi chapter three. But no one can endure the day of his coming. Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. He will sit as the refiner and purifier of silver. Wait a minute, how do you refine and purify silver? You heat it up. One place it says that he's like a, a potter finishing a clay pot. How does the potter finish a clay pot? He heats it up. Now, because I'm in a westernized European white people church, I know I have to explain this. This is not literal. God is not setting people on fire. God is not a 10-year-old boy with a magnifying glass, a lighter, and daddy issues. Any story that includes God setting people on fire and torturing them is not compelling. Don't you want what we have? We get to spend eternity with a guy torturing people. No, it was a euphemism. The word fire is the word pure. All forms of the word purity come from that. The word brimstone means to purify by burning. The idea, these are euphemisms. These aren't literal things. These, these are, one rabbi said it this way, that the fire of heaven is God's relentless pursuit to make you better while allowing you to keep your free will. It's that. So I started looking through heaven. And I started asking myself questions like, where in my life does the purification need to take place today? And I prayed a prayer, this very dangerous prayer. If you want to pray it, I'd encourage you to do it, but I'd encourage you to mean it. And the prayer goes something like this. Lord, give me, give me the grace to see this differently and the irresistible urge to respond to what I see. And I started seeing things about heaven. Some of it I was okay with, some of it I wasn't okay with. I'm truly okay sitting at a table with every tribe, tongue, and race. I think that'd be pretty cool. I'm okay with the no greed thing. I, I am. I, I, I like the whole let's share and be generous. I, I, I like that. I, I, I personally don't like the part where he said, heaven, the environment of heaven, everybody gets the same pay whether you started work at 6 a.m. or 5 p.m. That bothers me because I started work at 6 a.m. And so I got to become okay with people I don't think are okay because they've done less than me. But, but if you turn that around, that's very relieving because what that means is, is that I don't have to outdo Mother Teresa to be okay. <laughs> I like that. I don't like the part where it makes me be okay with those I see doing less than me. But I'm working on it. But this is one of the areas of heaven that I find very challenging. And I find that it's true that we have to ask ourselves this every day. This is not a once and for all time sort of, hey, I made this decision and this is okay. This is something I find we have to examine every day. This is something that Jesus said about heaven. Here's what it says in Revelation 22. This is John's revelation. And I'm gonna show you what Jesus said in Matthew 25. Revelation 22, 12, and behold, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to each according to his work. Hmm. So in one sense, everybody gets the same wage, but you don't get the same reward. And that starts to be compelling. Makes you question. Here, here's how Jesus said it, Matthew 25. He's talking about heaven. And he said, it is as if a man was going abroad and called his own servants and gave them his goods. And to one he gave five talents and to another two and to another one. And to each according to his own ability. And he went abroad at once. And going on, he had received the five talents, traded with them and made another five. And likewise, he had received two, gained another two. But he had received the one talent, went and dug it in the earth and hid his Lord's silver. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and took account with them. And so he, he who had received the five talents came and brought another five, saying, Lord, you delivered five talents to me. And behold, here's five talents above them. And his Lord said to him, well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Now I'll make you rule over many things. Enter in the joy of the Lord. And the one with two talents did the same. And the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now I'll make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And he had received the one talent. Came and said, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter. And I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the earth. And now you have yours back. And his Lord answered him and said to him, evil and slothful servant. You knew that I'll reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you should have put my money to the exchangers and coming out would have at least received my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given and he will abound. But from him who has not, 
even that which he has will be taken away. You okay with that? It's Jesus' teaching on heaven. You okay with Jesus taking something from someone who doesn't have and giving it to someone who has more? One observation real quick. Does that sound like Jesus? A guy whose whole message was, you rich people, make sure you take care of poor people. So mate, this isn't talking about money. It's a play on words with the word talent. On the surface, it's just simply saying that in heaven, God's a good businessman. Let me explain it this way. If I'm a contractor and you're a subcontractor and I give you 10 jobs and at the end of the day, I say, how'd the 10 jobs go? You say, well, I finished eight, but I didn't get to two. And the next day, I give you 10 jobs and you finish eight and you, and you don't finish two. And the next day, I give you 10 jobs and you finish eight and you don't finish two. And the next day, I give you 10 jobs and you finish eight and you don't finish two. And the next day, I give you 10 jobs and you finish eight and you don't finish two. What am I gonna start doing? I'm gonna give you eight jobs. And I'm gonna take the two that you're not doing and I'm gonna give it to someone who has the capacity to do it. <clears throat> In other words, the kingdom of heaven is like, God's got a mission to get done and if you're not gonna do what he's asked you to do, he's gonna take what he asked you to do and give it to someone who'll give it a go. <clears throat> so on the surface, it's still sort of like, well, duh. God operates as a pretty good businessman. But then there's a question of heart. In, in, in this, you, you've got this guy that um, he gets scared. Let me make a couple of observations about it. Uh, one, the one who buried his talent had a skewed view of the master. The belief that God is a hard slave driver only hinders our potential. Whatever energy we're spending trying to get okay with a God that's already okay with us is only energy we can't spend making somebody else's life better. The question is this, are we using what God gave us to bring heaven to earth or are we burying it? And that's a question we need to ask at least on a weekly basis. What have you done with what God gave you? Are you using it for God or have you buried, have you buried it in the earth? Are you using it for God or have you buried it in the earth? Because here's the truth of heaven. In heaven, whatever you've used for God will be celebrated and multiplied. But whatever you've buried will be uprooted and given to someone else. Are you still forgiven? Yes. Are you still saved? Of course. Does God still love you? Yes. But in the kingdom of heaven, if you're a barrier, then you're going to lose what God gave you. Essentially, the principle is this. Whatever you want to keep there, you better be using here. Let's say, let's say it this way. If heaven invaded your life today... You would find out if you used what God gave you for the common good or if you buried it. So here's my question. Are you using what God gave you for the common good or is it buried in the ground somewhere? Hey, according to the World Health Organization, 16,900 children are gonna die today of starvation. 16,900 children are gonna die today. And by the way, they died yesterday and the day before and they'll die tomorrow. 16,900 children are gonna die today. Here's my question. What's your refrigerator look like? Would it affect your life that much if you fed one a day? Considering it only cost a dollar? Really? What's the last thing you spent a dollar on? My God, a Zarafa's coffee costs six dollars. So next time you go by and get one, Six children. It's amazing. A six dollar drink. Are we burying something? Somebody buried something. What's your refrigerator look like? 16,900 children are going to die. Wait, my guess is there's a couple hundred people here. Why, why couldn't, just because of this room, why couldn't that stat be 16,700? Why not? Who else is going to do something? What, what are we going to do? Just say, well, she'll be right. Well, no, she won't be right. 16,900 people dying today. Children dying of starvation today. Hey, have you ever had somebody at your work say something like this to you? Hey, how can your God be real with all the suffering in the world? You ever, you ever had that, right? And, and you find it sort of offensive, don't you? Like, it's sort of like, oh, oh, don't talk about my God like that, right? So you get like all riled up on the inside. You get like sort of like, like riled up. But then you walk away and secretly you go, you know what? They got a good point. I mean, there is a lot of suffering in the world. And if God was all powerful, he should be doing something, right? Right? Do you know what the answer to that is? Let me give you the answer to that, okay? It's actually in Forbes magazine. 
Um, Forbes magazine in October came out with what's called the Forbes 400. Essentially, it's the 400 richest people in the world, okay? According to Forbes magazine, the 400 richest people in the world have $1.27 trillion. So it is within the power of 400 people, $1.27 trillion. Let me tell you how much money that is. That's enough money to put clean water and sanitation and sewer in the whole world. That's enough money to educate the whole world. That's enough money to vaccinate the whole world against disease. And that's enough money to start the perpetual production of food in order to end world hunger and still leave them all billionaires. Or it's enough money to run the US government for four days. Either way. And God's the failure? No, somebody buried something. Did God withhold the resources necessary to fix the world? No, it's within our power to do this. It's within the power of 400 people in the world to pretty much fix the whole thing. And when I say that, does something inside of you go, my God, they ought to do something. Are you right? Yes. Are you wrong? Yes, it's none of your business what they do. If 400 people could do that, if you drove a car here today, you're in the richest 700 million people in the world. So if 400 people could do that, what could the richest 700 million do if they got together and decided to with intention make this world a better place? God did not fail. We buried stuff. The only thing that's keeping heaven from coming to earth is a shovel to unbury what God gave us. You know what the leading cause of blindness in the world is? Dirty water. The children drink it, their gut sort of adjusts. But over time, that same parasite causes cataracts. These little girls and boys are completely blind by three years old. There was an Australian eye doctor named Fred Hollows. He said, that is not okay. And he's given his whole life. Now he's dead and his foundation lives on what they do is they go into third world places and they restore sight to the blind. You know what it cost? $25. $25 is what cataract surgery cost. You know what cataract surgery cost in America? $2,700. S same surgery, same exact procedure. In one place cost $2,700, in another place cost $25. Somebody's burying something somewhere. Someone's bearing something. Two billion people in the world are living on less than $2 a day. 1.5 billion are considered so malnourished they're in danger. Somebody buried something. God's not the failure. It is within the power of all of us to unbury our talent and fix this place, which is what we're called to do, which is what we're called to do. You, you know, when you hear the story of someone unburying their talent, man, it, it, like, it motivates you, doesn't it? Like, there's this lady... Um, she's a hero of mine. Her name's Kyla Alexander. And Kyla, you see the video with the uh, mentally handicapped Chinese children? Kyla runs the place. Kyla's 39 years old. And with intention, she said, I'm going to make these kids' lives a better place. But every yes requires a thousand no's. So to do that, she had to say no to her desire to be married and have a family. She had to do that in order to live with the intention and purpose that God gave to her life. And she is spending every day of her life restoring dignity to mentally handicapped children in China. When you hear that, don't you say, yes, go Kyla. I went and ministered inside China with her. You know what she told me? Prepare to get mad, by the way. Just prepare yourself. You're fixing to get mad. Not at me, I hope. You're fixing to get mad, though. She told me she had to cut her own pay. But she wasn't making anything anyway. I said, why? She said, our biggest church supporter cut us. I said, well, churches go through financial hardships. And, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. She said, that's not why. She said, they sent a missions team here to help us. And um, it's China, so you can't make the kids say the sinner's prayer. You can't do that. We would lose all of our rights with the government. You can't, you can't do that. So, what, you know, I had to put some rules around that. And so they pulled their support. And what the pastor said was, was what good is what you're doing if they're going to burn in hell anyway? Wow. Wow. So what's his name? <laughs> I opened up and opened up a can in a long time on somebody. What is wrong with somebody? 
What good is what you're doing restoring dignity to mentally handicapped children? So God's like torturing mentally retarded kids now? Is that our story? Are we sticking to that? The story stinks. I looked at the situation. I said, that is not okay. And Shane Willard Ministries has made a commitment to make up that difference because that is not okay. We need more Kylas in this world and burying their talent. There's a friend of ours named Brandon Eckert in Cape Town. Brandon was a member of the 26s. It's a prison gang in Polesmore Prison. And he listened to my message, the authority of the rabbi, and he gave his heart to the Lord. Now there's a revival in Polesmore Prison. Actually, the head of all the 26s in South Africa gave his heart to the Lord listening to the same message. <laughs> And so Brandon got out of prison and he's like, you know what? This is not, this is not what we're going to do. This, this, we're going to bring heaven to earth. And so he started a thing because he realized that most people go to Portsmouth prison because they're born into situations that they see no hope of getting out of and they're starving. So they steal. And so he said, if we can fix that, we can stop the cycle. And so he started a ministry that got gang members and prostitutes and stuff off the street and get them off drugs and get them educated. It's a three-step process. One, you get them off drugs. Two, you get them high school educated. Three, you get them job trained and you can, you can change poverty. And now we are, we are recognized as a viable option, an alternative to Polesmore Prison by the Department of Justice in South Africa. Essentially, if you commit a crime that's a low-level crime, you have a choice. You can go to prison or you can come with us. If you complete our program, that counts as your prison time. If you drop out of our program, you have to go back to prison. So far, we have a 100% success rate. And what we do is we get them off drugs, we get them educated, and we change the cycle of poverty in that community because a guy named Brandon Eckert was decided, I'm not gonna live in such a way where I bury what God gave me. I'm gonna unbury my talent. And when we hear stories, like that we're like yes yes go Brandon go Brandon there's stories like that of people all over this world people you'll never hear of people who aren't on TBN and don't have big hair and sit on gold seats people who who have been willing to sit back and they've been willing to unbury their talent and bring the kingdom of heaven to every place they see hell on earth and when we hear it it motivates us which leads me to this question why not you why not you? What are you burying that you could unbury? Let's ask it a couple of questions this way. The quality of what you're living for is only determined by what you're willing to die for. What, what does your, let's, let's ask it this way. What, what does your life revolve around? Temporary pleasure or God's redemptive will for all creation? Does your life revolve around things that are temporary? A good feed of steak. That's a good thing to have. I love it. But in five hours, you're gonna be hungry again. It's temporary. A good feed of steak is a good thing to have, but if your whole life revolves around it, it's just not there, it's temporary. Things that are vapors. Look, I know you love your rugby. And you know, I, I know that, 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 that Queensland against New South Wales in the, in the, what's that called? The state of origin. Like that's like a really big deal. And if you're from Queensland, I hope Queensland beats the dog snot out of New South Wales. And if you're from New South Wales, well, we're in Queensland right now, so we're going to be Queenslanders. <laughs> if you're from Queensland, I hope Queensland beats them to death. I'll cheer for them. Yes, go Queensland. I hope the Brisbane Broncos win everything. Whatever you want in sport, I hope that's true. But if the Brisbane Broncos win everything this year, six months later, you'll have a hard time remembering it. It's temporary. It's a good thing. It is. It's not bad. It's not sinful. It's, not, it's a good thing. But if your whole life revolves around something like that, your life sucks. Your life needs something better in it. You know what I find? Is that people like Kyla don't worry about the things we worry about. They don't. They don't. I've been coming to Australia eight years. I checked my passport. I think I've come 52 times. <laughs> Unbelievable how much of time I spent on a plane. Eight years. You know they're still fixing the same road. America rebuilt New Orleans faster than y'all built the M1. What's going on with that? I still, going from Karina to Rabina, I'm going, how long does it possibly take to build a road? But when Kyla comes here, she doesn't notice. She's like, you live in a country where you can drive cars on roads. Yeah. And by the way, children are starving. Let's solve that. 
Let's use energy for that. What's the last thing that made you, what's the last thing that made you angry enough to, un, to get out a shovel and unbury your talent? What makes you mad? Girl, the grocery store's taking forever, Shane. It's cashier. You're like, I only had six items. I was rushing to the express lane and someone jumped in front of me and they got 21 items and the sign clearly says 15 items or less. Kyla's like, what? You, you have a store? You can drive a car too? Where people prepackage food for you and you're complaining about how slow the checkout lady is? Really? See, see, people who've unburied their talent, nothing bothers them except for big things. If small things are bothering you, I'm here to tell you, you can be free from that. And the answer to that is not being prayed for. The answer to that is giving your life to something bigger. Hmm. Let, let me ask you this way. What are you willing to do that for today? Are you willing to unbury your talent today? Today. What do you, and this is very important. If you tune me out, tune me back in. In the kingdom, it's not the summation of what I've done like addition. It's the measure of what I've done based on what was given to me. In other words, you don't have to outdo me, Emma, Mother Teresa, Brandon, Kyla. You don't have to outdo those people. You only have to do with what God gave you to do. What's your ratio looking like? What have you done with what you've been given? Let me say it this way. When heaven hits earth, it will reveal whether your life was built on something that matters or on something that'll be burnt up. Do you have an internal sense now that your life is about something bigger? And if not, why not? We spent $11 billion on cosmetics. We spent $11 billion trying to make ourselves prettier. Is it working? Do you feel better about yourself? Or even with all that makeup, do you still look in the mirror and see the flaw? Out of $11 billion, three billion were spent by men. What are you doing? If you're a man buying makeup to get prettier, stop. It's embarrassing. What could you give up? Do, do you re, c could you feed one? You say, well, Shane, all I could do is feed one. Then do it. Don't bury it. Just because you can't fix the whole thing means you don't try? That's like Homer Simpson logic. <laughs> don't do that. The invitation of Jesus is this, that when heaven hits earth, what you used for God is going to be celebrated. What you buried is going to be given to somebody else. Please, right now, have the guts to take a shovel and get angry enough to unbury your talent. And if 16,900 children dying today doesn't do it for you, check your heart. I'm urging you. You say, Shane, where do I start? I don't know. I don't know you. But you can start one by calling. You can call your pastor this week. You can say, Pastor, I, I, I have buried some talent and I'd like to partner with you to help make this world a better place. I'm a musician. I can show up and greet people at the door. I can drive the food truck to feed the poor. I can, I can give two hours of my time to pack up food parcels. I can do something. Do, do you know that there, there, there's, a homeless, there's a homeless shelter in my town that has more than enough food donated to feed everybody for free, but they have to turn people away? Do you know why? Because they can't find enough hands to serve the free food that was donated. So you mean to tell me that there's more than enough food to feed everybody that shows up at that shelter, but they have to turn people away because they can't find enough hands to serve the food at noon? Are you kidding me? You mean there's not 10 people who are watching soap operas at noon instead of serving somebody else? Really? Really? You mean there's not 10 people watching The Price is Right instead of serving someone else? You mean there's not 10 people waiting to see the end of their show? Get a DVR. DVR it. It's 2012. If you don't have a DVR, go get one. It's like $59. And use your time. You, 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 you could call him and say, hey, where do you need me? I want to unbury my talent. I hope I've created 40 calls for him today. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to make his life busy. <laughs> Come on. There's people dying. People dying. What are you going to do about it? You're going to go home and, well, she'll be right. No, she won't. No, she won't.
please respond to the invitation of Jesus to allow heaven to be established in you right now. And bury your talent. Let's pray together. Lord, you're wonderful. We love you. We honor you. Lord, would you give us the courage to see things differently and the irresistible urge to act upon what we see? If you're here today and you've never received what's been true about you since before the foundation of the world, the Bible says that Jesus wrote a story for your life before the foundation of the world. And um, if you've been living out of your own story instead of his, here's my invitation to you. My invitation to you is to choose to trust his version of your story instead of your own. You can do that very simply. Maybe you need to do that. And for the rest of you, would you be brave enough to pray a prayer right now that says, Lord, where can I unbury my talent? In Jesus' name, amen. Would you look this way? Thanks so much for letting me be your guest. I'd like to invite you to be back tonight. I'm gonna preach a message that um, is very special to me. It will revolutionize the way you look at life. You will, you will not wanna miss tonight to stay home and watch NCIS reruns. Um, Gibbs gets the bad guy. And if it's that important to you, DVR it. It's funner to watch it without commercials anyway. You get to like fast forward through it. It's really pretty cool. Um, so you can, you can come back, you can come back tonight. I, I, I bless you with an awareness that God has something big for your life. Step into it. Grace and peace be to you. God bless.